Pacers, Cavs, tonight, another huge game for the Pacers who can clinch a playoff berth with a victory. The keys to the game, the role player matchups that matter. Is the East actually good? Who can make a run between the Pacers and Cavs? Chris Manning from Locked On Cavs and I break it down today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Friday. Congrats. You made it through the week and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers. As always, my name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, diving into Pacers Cavs tonight, the biggest game of the Pacers season since Sunday when they had a huge game against the Heat, but a massive one today. Pacers win. They're in the playoff field. Pacers win. They continue to control their own destiny for the five seed. Some people question whether they should want the five, but that's still a relevant fact about this game. Magic beat the Sixers tonight. Pacers are in, so lots at stake in this game and around the league. Friday night, Chris Manning from Lockdown Cavs and I get a team up to break it all down. The key matchups in this game, the stars, how they're playing, which team can make a deep run in the playoffs in the East should they make it, and is the East actually good this year? Is it possible for one of these teams to shake things up in the conference. Chris hosted today, so he'll be talking first as we jump right in here on a Locked On Pacers, Locked On Cavs crossover. I'm Chris Manning. That is Tony East. This is a Locked On Pacers, Locked On Cavs crossover edition. Tony, Cavs Pacers, it's Friday. We've got some Eastern Conference chatter to get to. We've got some which we're going to ask a big question to end the show, which is which team is more capable of a big playoff run. But my friends, how are you? It's good to be with you. I'm great. I like this time of the NBA season where every game matters. Heck yeah, it's a playoff game before the playoffs. The winner of Cavs Pacers, they're in, baby. No playing tournament. And the Sixers are scaring everybody. So I love the stakes. Yeah, look, I, I gotta say too, from a Pacers perspective, the end of the year is a little more interesting on the Cleveland's on the Pacers side, just because like they get Atlanta and on Sunday, they kind of feel like they could be trending in more of the right direction in some ways. The Cavs are playing the Hornets in the last day of the regular season. I will not even be in town for that game because I, I have something going on that I'm going to be across the state for. But I don't like it's the Hornets, so I'm kind of not like upset that I'm missing the Hornets. The Hornets just beat the Hawks, man. They could. They uh, beat the. They beat the, they beat the Cavs too. So <laughs> they beat the Pacers twice this season. So they're bad. They're the the bad. Ho- No, no, no. We're gonna talk about the East later. Uh, let me tell you, the Hornets are pr- propping up the Eastern you, Conference. Um, your swer- big swerve. It's like Lamelo. <laughs> they just need to like let Brandon Miller do his thing, and they're gonna be fine. But Tony, what are you looking forward to? Cavs Pacers Friday night in Cleveland. A big game for both teams. You would think on paper. What are you looking for? Yes. Well, stakes is the boring thing I already said, but you know, it's been funny for the Pacers throughout the season, like in season tournament at the time, biggest game these young Pacers have ever played. Right. And you could quibble between how you feel about important regular season games in the in season tournament, but they played the heat last Sunday, similar thing, huge tiebreaker game, huge postseason implications game. One of the biggest games this young team's ever played. Now, again, we're at that point where they control their own destiny for the fifth seed. Uh, can clinch a playoff berth in two ways on Friday, one by winning and the other by Orlando beating Philly. How do they look? Can they handle the pressure? I mean, they beat the Cavs twice this season, but then they fell flat in their face against the skeleton Cavs in Indy, you know, a month ago or whenever that game was. So how do they come out and how do they look? At least big picture will be revealing to me. And I think this is only the second time this season they've gone against Donovan Mitchell. He missed their very first matchup and their last matchup. I think he played the in-season tournament game. So how does that kind of change things up, right? Because Andrew Nemhard is such a good guard defender. He can handle when one's available himself, but when they're both there, you know, that that changes how a lot of stuff works downstream in terms of Aaron Neesmith's matchup, where Tyrese Halberton is, is hidden, what it looks like in the front court. So you know, we haven't actually seen this. I think this is as close to full strength as we've seen both of these teams. So, who can actually pull it off and what does it look like? Because this could be a first round matchup, even still. It's gonna be there's a lot that will be learned about these teams and can be looked forward to. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's about Mitchell. Like, I, I don't know exactly where he's at. I don't know exactly like where he is ramping up to. 
you know, we were talking on Locked on Cavs the other day, Tony, about like if it's the Cavs versus the Pacers or the Cavs versus the Magic, like which series is better to try to get Mitchell in a rhythm and try to unlock whatever is probably not here, but maybe is here with this Cavs team for this year. And I think it has to be the Pacers just because they don't have the defensive. They're just not a good defensive team in the way Orlando is and like not even close. But we're also like if if Mitchell can't like blow by defenders against the Pacers who don't have a, a great perimeter defender to throw at him, like what like Neesmith is cool, but is he going to really stop Mitchell? Probably not. Like what's your other option with 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 you know no math and everything? I think you're in a weird position where it's like if you kind of see Friday that Mitchell doesn't have that burst still against this team with very little time to go to the playoffs, I think you're probably should be already low levels of confidence go down even a little bit more if that's the case. So I'm, I'm all eyes on Mitchell. Obviously, like the Cavs just probably could use two wins in a row to feel normal, but that that's one of the things I'm absolutely looking at. Well, that kind of leads to my big, big picture question about the Cavs. I've caught a little Cavs recently, but they were on a West Coast swing and I'm not staying up late to watch the Cavs, Chris. So how much of their recent struggles are Donovan Mitchell got PRP and had a nose injury, nasal, whatever, versus general team struggles, right? They had that, what was it, 18 and two was that peak stretch in, in mm-hmm. December, January. Like, wh- why aren't they that team anymore? And the opposite, why are they kind of bad right now? I think it starts with Mitchell. It's not everything with him because that's not how this works, but I think it starts with him, right? Like, he has been injured. He has not been healthy. When he is not that and he is not the driver of your success in the way he was for that that run you alluded to, Tony, like, I, I think that says a lot. I think that puts you in a really, really bad position um i think you're in a position where when he's not that guy okay like what are you what is the identity of your team you know that that puts you in this very difficult position um i i don't know what to do with that if you're the Cavs, right like it's not everything i think the other part of it on top of that it's just the fact that their defense, for a variety of reasons, team shooting from three well against them, guys just not playing that connected, guys looking like they've almost like never played together at times, which is the weirdest part about all this. Their defense has just fallen off a cliff. It's been horrendous for several weeks now. And when you're a team that is built on defense and has been built on a defensive identity first and trying to do enough offensively, you end up looking like this. And I, I don't know what you're even supposed to do with that. Yeah, it is odd that they haven't been, you know, solid. Def- like, that's what I think of when I think of the Cavs. Obviously, Mitchell's amazing and can give you a certain floor offensively, but I think of them as a defensive team ahead. Like, they were top one, basically, in recent seasons. So, to see that kind of drop has been surprising, especially because they have size. Like, in theory, their defense should travel even in, you know, games where it's not a perfect matchup for them. But to see that kind of trickle away has been really surprising to me from an outsider's perspective and even, like, in the month of March, when the Pacers rounded into form and were at least decent on the defensive end, they were 14th at defense. Cavs were 21st. Pacers better than the Cavs on defense? What are we doing, Chris? What's happening? So, obviously, the Pacers, now that Halberton first 30-point game in three months on Tuesday, and Siakam are rolling a little bit, and they have that defense, are playing better than the Cavs right now. We can keep talking about these form things. They all matter. But this is one game, right? One guy gets hot. The right thing happens. Someone's postseason bound, and they both play easier games Sunday, but I don't think either of these teams want to wait till Sunday, Chris. No, I think they'd both just like to win and have some normalcy. Like, I do think both teams just could, like, use every win you could get to some degree. Like, I don't feel great about any of these teams in the East, but, you know, the Pacers are 7-3 and three out of their last 10. Cavs are 4-6, and six, but they won their last game. You know, Indiana uh, is, is pretty decent on the road, all things considered this year. Obviously, better at home, as most teams are, but... Like, I think both teams just where this is at with what seating is on the line, how jam-packed the middle of the East is, every little win could could matter in, in that sense. And, like, like even I – don't, I, I don't expect to really learn very much. I And maybe that's just because, Tony, my opinions are kind of solidified on this Cavs team and what they are right now, just because I don't, I don't know much how I'm going to learn over two games. I do think that the seeding stuff is probably the most important thing on top of just what does Mitchell look like. I, Mitchell Mitchell's probably the one thing I would just want to see what what kind of how it progresses because if that burst again if that burst isn't there what are we doing here? Yeah, that's true. I think if you're the Cavs too like if you get 6 or higher, you get a not a week but close 
to that much time off while the planned tournament happens to get Mitchell looking more like Mitchell, like Halliburton finally having two days off in a row. A lot of his best games, or at least games where he looks athletic again, happen after that, where he has two or three dunks in a game, like last weekend that happened. or And that's happening leading up to this Cavs game, too. They had two days off since playing on Tuesday, right? Like, I think that matters for guys who have whatever injuries to their leg. And so, yeah, that, that could matter for Mitchell should the Cavs actually clinch top six. It's crazy to me that they aren't technically in yet. Like, it feels like with how high they got in the East at times, they should already be there. Um, yeah, the Mitchell thing's big to me. What do you think of... Turner and Allen and and how that defensive kind of area can change the game. I only ask that because, yeah, there were guys missing, but the last Pacers-Cavs game, 108-104, a real uh, stinker on the scoreboard. Yeah, I think it's going to, if Mitchell gets pulled, if, if Allen gets pulled out and the defense again just looks all over the place, wouldn't be shocked. I, I don't know how you could have confidence in what the Cavs are, are doing defensively right now. Um Is that your number one matchup? I, I guess that's the last thing I'm going to ask about this game for you, Tony. Is like, is the Allen versus Turner thing your number one matchup for for Friday? Yeah, that's my biggest swinging matchup. I would say, like, when the Pacers are at their best, I mean, most teams truly are at their best this way is when they get into the paint and play from there. Whether that's scoring at the rim, making good passes from inside the paint, whatever. And so, if they can open up that paint via Miles Turner shooting it well and forcing Jared Allen to like take half a step farther out or you know, just at least thinking about what he has to do more uh, or at least just putting pressure on him in general, even if Turner is not having a good night, you know, that is valuable to them. Same way it's valuable for the Cavs. If, if they're just blown by perimeter players all night and forcing Turner to cover up for a bunch of stuff, that's when the Pacers defense is at its worst, right? Is when they're too aggressive running guys off the line or just playing awful perimeter defense in general. And then again, they've picked it up recently, but not to the highest degree. So yeah, I think that of the non-star players, I depend, maybe you can call, former all-star Jared Allen in that group. But I would say of the non-star players, the Turner-Allen matchups, the most important one to me in this game. All right, up next, we're going to ask just a, a big question. Are any of these teams in the East good? That's a bad for this. Everybody, first up, we're going to tell you about Stitch Fix. You know that instant confidence boost you get from an outfit that makes you feel look and feel really good? Well, that's what I get with Stitch Fix. With Stitch Fix, you get a stylist who understands your style, size, and budget. They do all the shopping for you. It is the easiest way to update your wardrobe this season. You can easily upgrade your wardrobe with a professional stylist that will help you find new on-trend favorites that will work for you. You just give them your size, style, and budget preferences, and boom, you get boxes that order straight to you when you want how you want, no subscription required. You get five just for you pieces, plus outfit recommendations, pro styling advice. Keep what works, send back the rest. Your stylist sends you the just right pieces, and the fit is on point. They're just ready, they get you. It makes it all so easy with Stitch Fix. You, if you don't like to shop, they save you that time and effort. Plus, you get outfits that make you feel and look really good. And if you don't love something, just send it back. Shipping, returns, exchanges, always free. Style that makes you feel as good as you look. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash lockdown. Again, that is stitchfix.com slash lockdown. One more time, stitchfix.com slash lockdown. And also check out the good folks at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The winning formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and plenty more parts, whether you're into speed, power, or style. eBay Motors has you covered with over 122 million parts. That's a lot. For your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you are looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time. You'll get your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. We're back here. Lockdown Cavs. Lockdown Pacers crossover. Great Woo. stuff. T Tony. Boston is obviously very good. They might be my pick to win the title. Okay. Are any of these other teams in the East actually good? All right. So I come with competing arguments in my brain. So here's what I'll say. If you look at the East win-loss versus the West, did you actually know this? The last two years before this, 
The East had a winning record versus the West. I did not know that. This year, either. this year the East is at a 47 winning percentage versus the West. That is the worst since 2014-15. So on one hand, I want to say, well, the West is clearly far superior. And besides the Celtics, there's a lot of flimsier East teams. Like the second seed in the East is probably going to have 50, 51 wins. The Mavs are currently fifth in the West at 50 wins. Here's the other problem, though. The East has a lot of crap <laughs> that makes it kind of like a lot more crap that makes it a little less fair in evaluating the East versus West record in that Detroit, Washington, and Charlotte are just awful and Toronto and Brooklyn aren't any good. And the bottom of the play-in teams, which matters for this discussion because they're going to make the playoffs, also stink, right? So here's what I think. I think the mid-tier two, that eh, two is probably too high. Two through eight in the East is probably about as good as four through 10 in the West to me. But the very top end of the West is better than the top of the East. And the very bottom of the West is way better than the bottom of the East. And that's where I think the conference difference lies. That said, if Giannis is out, and we already know Julius Randle's out, yeah, this is not a great East field this year. It's just not like I, th Tony, I, I look at it this way. I think the two teams I would feel most scared of that aren't the Boston Celtics right now are the Philadelphia 76ers and the Miami heat and the heat's off. Of Ooh, reputation. I disagree, but continue the heat, the heat's off a of reputation and Phillies cause Joel Embiid and Tyrese yeah, Maxey and the way they're playing, it's just, they're going to, they're going to whip, right? Like they're going to absolutely whip. Then uh, maybe the Knicks ahead of the Heat would be the, the where I should probably go. So let's just let's revive the Knicks and Sixers. So the three seed and the seven seed. Not scared of the Cavs. Don't think they're winning a playoff series at this point. The Magic, like really good talent. Love the long term odds of them. If they were like a, a stock, I would not be shorting them right now. I don't think that offense is good enough to succeed in the playoffs. The Pacers can't defend anybody. If they win a series, it's because they play Cleveland, and Cleveland just sucks it up for a series, and that happens. Like. The nine and ten teams in in the East are nowhere near like what they are in the West. Like Houston's better than both of those teams, you know. Agreed. Like, what are we doing here? I I think the East is so soft, and on top of that, the gap between one and two is absurd. Up Boston down. obviously great. It's great. Boston might win the title. I just don't think any of these teams actually like are even maybe even going to push Boston. I. I would love to see like if our friends at FanDuel had like a, a line of like the over under number of games for Boston between the the, <laughs> the, the finals just in the East. It's like fourteen. Is it like fourteen and a half? They need to get twelve <laughs> wins. Is the, is it over under like are they going to play fourteen games? They're going to like like four zero four one four one. Like what's the like what is coming? I don't know. It's very possible they just run ran shackles through these because none of these teams are actually that good. Well, the, the, the West wasn't that awesome last year, and the Nuggets took 18 games to win a chance, or whatever it was, to win the title, right? They played, they won 16 so, and lost four. Yeah, so 20. Not bad math for so, me, but similar argument, right? Except the, the inverse conference. Yeah. If you had to pick I, Tony, so, like, I, can, take, can I ask I've you this? Not, yes. If you had to pick a team to beat Boston or push them to, like, six or seven, who would it be? Like, would it be New Philly? York. No, it's New York. Okay. Okay. I think New York's really good. Uh, Tibbs is a good playoff coach. We've seen it. Brunson's awesome in the playoffs. Like He was the only reason they weren't an embarrassment against the Heat last year. OG makes that team really good. And he's actually playing again, which some people didn't expect to happen. Hartenstein and Mitchell Robinson's an awesome center rotation. Like The team just works. It fits. Yeah, they don't have Randall, but they've still been good in his... Not as good, but still been good in his absence. Like... I just think their toughness and style works and can make that uncomfortable for anybody. I would have picked them as the best chance to beat Boston with Randall for sure. With Adam, it's harder to say. I think it's probably close with Philly now because Philly was close last year and Embiid's unbelievable mm -hmm. at his peak. Here could be the problem though. What if it's what if it's Nick Sixers round one? Like it's just it's just tough to to parse out what that could look like. Yeah. Um <laughs> Boston. I just am so like uninspired by these teams. So, Maybe that's just because I'm so uninspired by the Cavs, but like I just look at the West and I'm like, I cannot wait for Clippers Mavs. I can't wait for like Pelicans Thunder. Here, like, here's the other thing I think about the East. It's an odd time of like old guardy teams, although the Celtics have moved past that. They're gonna keep being good. Like, who knows what this Bucks Giannis era is in right now? 
who knows what the heat Jimmy era is in right now, but it seems like they're fading towards the end. Whereas the, mm-hmm. the, like, it looks like two, three, four, five is going to feature a bunch of teams making it for the first time or like ascending young teams. And that's kind of what the West was last year too. And now it's even more happening with this young thunder team and the Grizzlies will be back next year. And, a young Wolves team ascending in. Like, it's different. It's a change, whereas the Lakers and Warriors are at the bottom of the conference. Like, I kind of think that's happening in the East. And in the first year of it, it, it makes it seem like the conference stinks because it's unproven teams and, like, declining old teams. But then everybody gets their crap together in the next year, and it looks better. So I think the East will look better next year for sure. Also, the West is going to be bananas next year. But that is another take I have on the East. Yeah. I'm what the East looks like year from now. What happens in the summer will be very, very fun to to follow all along with. I am very sure. All right, up next, which of the teams between the Cavs and the Pacers actually could make a deeper playoff run? Let's debate that topic after this. Today's episode is brought to you by Fandle. Fandle is the official sports book of Locked On. Tony, before I give everyone the wonderful ad copy, going to give them some betting odds from FanDuel for tomorrow night's game. Pacers plus 124 on the money line. Cabs minus 146, so a $10 bet would win you 685 For Cleveland, if you bet $10 on the Pacers, you'd win $12.40. Cavs are a three-point favorite, and the over-under is at a 233-and-a-half. So keep that all in mind. You can check that all out on FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and the NFL. Baseball's in full swing. See what you did there. And FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. All right, Tony. So which of these teams, in your opinion, Cavs or the Pacers, has a better chance of actually making it to, let's say, the Eastern Conference Finals? I don't think we think either of these teams have it in them to make the finals, but let's just say go on a kind of a Atlanta Hawks from a couple of years ago, ask a run. My yeah, cop-out answer is whatever team finds the elite thing they had at one point, first so you're right? copping out just just answer the yeah. question tony like let's pick a side here stop being well i think the given the recent run of play the safer bet is the pacers find their elite yes. offense with their current level of defense more likely than the Cavs find their elite defense with whatever the rest of their current level is so well i was gonna get there my cop out answer is gonna be if the Cavs find their elite defense that they had at times this season and have had oftentimes in past seasons they're very good. I mean, the Knicks punked them last year, but I think they learned from that experience, right? They're a better team for it. They have shooters that make sense. Everybody, included me, lauded their offseason. Like, all those moves should matter come postseason time. But if they can't defend at the levels they have before, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you can shoot better and do all these things. you got to be able to get stops. And the Pacers obviously have been atrocious defensively at their worst this season, but better recently. And we know what their offensive peak is. And even with Halliburton and a, whatever you want to call it, his last 10 games, he's looked good again. Like if they can hit top five, top two, whatever levels of offense with the defense they now play, that seems more likely to me than the Cavs' optimism outlook just because of recent play. Maybe Mitchell gets healthy and I look dumb. Maybe the Cavs' defense clicks and I look dumb. But recent history suggests it's more likely it's the Pacers, which feels very blue and gold colored glasses of me to say. But I mean, I, I, maybe I'm just scarred by the Cavs playoffs last year. I picked the Cavs in five last year, Chris. What was I thinking? I mean, maybe that's just scarring me a little bit. Were the lights too bright for you, too? I'm refer- I'm. I know what the out. reference you're making. It's like, okay. it's not even that, like, Brunson wasn't even that amazing. The Knicks just kicked their freaking butts. For the, you know, it was just, that is what stood out about that to me. And Brunson then was amazing in their second round series, but no one else was you know, good enough. Yeah. But that that is why maybe a little bit too I'm having trouble because I, I, I know the Cavs have a higher peak. They're just farther from it right now. Yeah, here's here's the real answer, I think. Oh, like it's okay. it, it's it's I think you are right in that it's like just some I didn't mean I'm just like was trolling, but I do think you're right. It's like just one of them find they're like a big good thing and lean on that for like two weeks and it's enough. I think the answer is what team doesn't end up on the opposite side of the Celtics. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Like it's that's funny what it's that, gonna take. It's been really funny to hear 
I don't know how you feel on the Cavs side of this, but like the Pacers for, let's just say since April 1st, whatever, March 25th, you know, the playoffs have been like tangible for the Pacers, but the whole time it's been, how do they make it? How do they make it? How do they make it? All of a sudden this week, everybody's asking me, Tony, should the Pacers not want to beat the Cavs so they can get the six seed instead of the five seed? I'm like, they got to make it before we talk about. Yeah. You, you can't the game, bracket they're you, on. <laughs> yeah. You can't get it when you, when you are like, just trying to like make it to the playoffs and like be functional. You can't worry about gaming playoff seating. Oh. Like you can't. If anything, I we should just let, like Boston pick which one of these teams. Like Boston, because of how far they have, should just get to pick yes. the bracket. That's the best. Like thing not even just their first round opponent. Yeah, I'm it's not even awesome. saying. Yeah, let's pick the full bracket. They get to organize it. It's like we just we want we want like the Cavs run one. We just think we can like cook them and like get this over with. And I'd be like, great, <laughs> cool. I don't. I think you're correct. <laughs> Like, yeah, like, well, to, to if I can point it last year as an example, like it was a big deal that the Warriors were able to get that time off by avoiding the plan, and they ended up beating the Kings in the first round, for example. I mean, obviously that matchup worked out great for them, and, you know, it wasn't so good for the Nets who got steamrolled by the Sixers, but the Nets might not have gotten out of the play-in in the East, right? Like it can have a lot of value to be in the field at all, have that gap, see what your team needs. In the summer, I've said this for the playoffs, or for the, excuse me, for the Pacers specifically. Like, not only do you want to make it because you want to make it as the Pacers, you're committed, you're pot committed, you give up your first round pick. You want as many games as possible of postseason data to say, here's what we need next for this team. I'd assume the Cavs are similar, similar in that in that boat, although they're in a little different of a position in that they might have to make significant tweaks soon. So, you know, I think that's valuable too. Is you to earn those games, you got to make it right. So. I agree with you that avoiding the Celtic side, should you have a chance come Sunday, is important. But you got to clinch the whole thing first. And maybe Orlando beats Philly on Friday, and both Pacers and Cavs could roll into Sunday feeling great and smiling. But they got to win a game first. And, and that's what makes it really tricky to know who can make the conference finals because if you're in the 4-5, uh, your chances of making the conference finals are, I mean, what would you say, less, less than half a percent? The Celtics are unbelievable. Yeah, you're getting cooked. Um, <laughs> I think the other thing that's like makes these seem interesting points of comparison, Tony, is they both have star guards who have dealt with some injury issues, right? Like, yes, the Cavs have had issues with Mitchell's knee. We don't know exactly where he's going to end up. Halliburton has, you know, had the hamstring issues, and that has hampered him for large chunks of the season after he was maybe the breakout star of the league up through the NBA Cup, right? Like, yep. Um, sorry, the Emirates NBA Cup is we're gonna have to not refer to in the future. <laughs> shout out, shout out. Look at you go. Out. Chris, are you yeah. during All Star Weekend? Like, excuse me, sorry, it's the Mountain Dew Star E three point nine, or whatever. Um, no, you know, no, uh, <laughs> no. I just think the Emirates thing's funny to me because it's it's literally like the NBA has taken so much from European soccer, and that is literally the sponsor of the of the of Every the European team. soccer. Well, it's the equivalent of the year. It's the sponsor of the European equivalent of the NBA Cup. It's where they got the inspiration oh, from. Is also sponsored by Emirates, so it's just like That's true. It's like the NBA just is like, you know, you know who might be interested in a in a tournament format style product? Emirates, this airline. Um the can I give you yeah. one more Pacers thing on why I think there's yeah, a chance please. they have a better chance at the conference finals. Yeah, please. They have a higher I don't have, can I, I don't have yes. a good case for the Cavs. I really don't. Which maybe I'm just being a hater, but I really don't have a good case for it. Unless Mitchell's like bananas for two weeks. That's they how, have that's the best. Uh, they have a, the best sixty foot buzzer beater player in the league. Cleveland Cavaliers do. Shout out, shout out Max Truce. Um, I think the Pacers, because of their offensive style, have a high variance in terms of like it, in terms of how they can score. Like they take a lot of threes. They generate good open threes. And like if you just have a series where you're just lights out, you could just happen to win, right? So I think that gives them a chance that. If you're a lower variance team or lower volume team, and the Cavs, to JB Bickerstaff's credit, they were like bottom five in three point volume for the first couple months of the season, have at least become a more will willing. I, I don't know what the right word is. I'll let you ponder that shooting team, but not to the level of the Pacers or many other teams. Yeah. Tough stuff. Uh, Tony, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> I'm I look I will just say this I th if people listen to our show yesterday like they will have already understood this the lockdown Cavs show I should say I am just like so unconvinced that this team is the cap this Cavs team is capable of like anything that's interesting I like the Cavs when they were peaking but the vibe something's off man the vibes are off that's my outside the vibes are off. Cavs. 
Vibes are off. Yeah, and I, I just don't think any team can show up in the playoffs and suddenly like fix the vibes or fix their play or fix anything enough to like actually make a big difference. I don't believe any teams are like rhythm and momentum and like good habits like add up over time. That is not what is happening here with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yeah, they also have to like clinch a postseason berth, which I know that it's so easy to look at the security blanket of a game against the Hornets, but same for the Pacers. Like the Hawks probably won't be trying on Sunday, but you, you want to play one game against Trey Young and you have to win? Like no one wants that. That's scary. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's an important game. If you have two chances, taking the first one's huge. Or again, it's going to be very funny, Chris. I don't know how we can pull this off. I would like to somehow see. If uh, both teams after the game, how they're feeling, and if they immediately tried to, how quickly after the game they checked the Magic Sixers score <laughs> on Friday will be very telling. Yeah, I hope it's just like on in, on the TVs that we can see the players. <laughs> on the of. Jumbotron during the game. Yeah, that's what I want. It actually starts before. Magic Sixers is at 7 and Pacers Cavs at 7. Oh. So mi- mid-fourth quarter, they can throw up the end of the Magic Sixers game if the Magic win. Both teams learn that they've clinched a playoff berth mid-game. <laughs> also, what are we... What are we? Can I just ask, what are we doing with the 7? Can we just do a 7 o'clock tip? Is this an ESPN game? Why what is it What's the deal? I don't know. That's dumb. 7 o'clock. Neither team played the night before or the next night. I don't get it. What are we... It's going to throw me off the whole day. I'm going to be like, okay, I got to be there by, you know, 4.45, and then I'll be like, oh, wait. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> No, you have so media. JB Bickerstaff will not talk until five forty-five. I know, I know. It always seven thirty always throws me off. Inside baseball for people behind the scenes. The the other thing about thirties is like even if a game's at eight, like I can just add an hour very easily to like get to the routine times of like when pregame is and all that stuff. When it's at X thirty, like anything thirty, I'm like, what? (laughs) Also the set. Also, games don't actually ever start on time, which drives me insane <laughs> because I'm insane. So just like start like that game's going to start at like 741 and I'm going to be like, great. We could have like you could have started this at seven and like no one would have like, what are we doing? Oh, my gosh. That drum first world problems. Tony. In NCAA tournament. Yeah. yeah we're... <laughs> no, but honestly, the NBA starts stuff on time. Like t- JJ Redick had a great rant about this, I believe. Like so like you could find that and have a link, but just start stuff on time. It would be great. TNT always starts on time. ESPN never starts on time. Or is that backwards? I don't know. No, I don't think anything. I don't think I've been to an NBA game that starts on time is the thing. I don't think they do. I think it's like seven. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a soft seven. You know, what does start on time. Locked on Pacers and locked on, locked Cavs. on Pacers and locked on Cavs, baby. Every That's true. single day. Subscribe, rate, review, both shows. Evan and I will be back Friday after Cavs Pacers. I was well. Cleveland very, very excited to see you. Check out Locked on Pacers for the side of it. Maybe we'll get these two teams in the playoffs and we can do this again, Tony. That would make me very happy. But until next time, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Cavs Pacers Friday. Thanks again to our sponsor, Stitch Fix, eBay Motors, and FanDuel.